This podcast has been brought to you by Seekers Guidance, the global Islamic seminary. Help us spread the light of prophetic guidance to millions around the world by becoming a monthly supporter. Make a small donation at seekersguidance.org forward slash donate. For as little as $10 a month, you can help people find life-changing guidance. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Assalamu alaikum to all of you. May God bless you all. May He give you a wonderful Ramadan. May He enable us to use this month in the way that God desires us to use it. And may we make this a month of tremendous profit that facilitates for us the path to the hereafter and the path to the knowledge of God. Allah says in the Qur'an, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I, God, did not create the jinn, the spirits, and humankind, but that they worship me. So we were created to do this. We were created to fast. We were created to pray. We were created to pay zakat. We were created to make umrah and hajj and to do other types of worship like dhikr and like vows that bring us close to God and so forth. The month of Ramadan is a great month. It is the great guest that we all welcome every year with fervor. And it's an amazing thing that although this is the time of the year which physically is the most demanding on the Muslims as an ummah, it is the time of the year that we all welcome with great joy and great fervor. And may you find that joy in your heart every single day and every single night of this month. The Prophet said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that patience, sabr, endurance is half of faith. People who do not have sabr, they cannot believe in God. We have got to be able to do the things that belief requires. And we have to be able to avoid the things that belief requires us to avoid. And that is an act of sabr, of patience and perseverance. And the Prophet said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that fasting is half of sabr. So therefore, that also makes fasting one quarter of iman. And the Prophet ﷺ said that fasting is the gate of worship. It is babul ibadah. And he urged his blessed wife Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, to always keep knocking at the door of God. And she asked, what is that door? And the Prophet ﷺ said, it is hunger. That is, it is fasting. So we ask that we utilize this month properly. This is a great month. This is a unique opportunity. And this is what our lives are all about. The month of Ramadan is, of course, conspicuously the month of fasting because that is the main thing that we do during the daylight hours. Of course, also, it is the month of prayer because during this month, standing up in prayer, doing taraweeh, is one of its important elements. And we want to join these two together with the same intensity. And never forget that the same wisdom that is there in the divine legislation for fasting is also there in the divine uh, imperative that we pray special prayers in Ramadan. Of course, we need to remind ourselves that some of us may have had lapses in our lives, and there may have been days and years when we didn't pray. And if that's the case, then in Ramadan and also at other times of the year, you should have a very diligent program to be making up all the prayers that you missed because this is a debt that you owe to God. And in the month of Ramadan, if you have prayers that you haven't made, 
That's what you should be doing. You should be making them up and not praying tarawih. When others are praying tarawih, you should be making up your prayers. And this is very, very important. Uh, until the voluntary, until the obligatory prayers are made up, there is no room for voluntary or for supererogatory prayers. You have to focus just on the obligatory prayers and then making up those prayers that have been missed. And you need to sit down, you need to make a list, you need to determine reasonably how many prayers did you miss and then begin to work at that, keeping a record of what you're doing. In any case, this is a great month. The act of worship, of prayer, is one that is in its entirety an act of heedfulness. In prayer, we go into the prayer with Allahu Akbar. We invoke God to envelop us in the hadra, in the presence of his kibriya, his absolute greatness that makes all creation fade, and his azamah, his glory and greatness. And when we pray, we aspire to attain that kind of prayer that the great Sahaba and the great Salaf as-Salih had, in which they would not even be aware of who was on their right hand or their left hand as they prayed. And they wouldn't be thinking about anything but God until they came out of it. That's the nature of prayer. One of the amazing things about fasting is that fasting doesn't, require that kind of total heedfulness. The more heedful that you are in fasting, then the greater the fast is, the more lofty it becomes, the more fulfilling. So we should be heedful of every breath we take in the day of Ramadan, every moment that we spend. Yet the mere fact of giving up our passions for food and drink and marital relations and the other things that are not allowed during the time of fasting, this in itself is sufficient to plant the seed of heedfulness so that it grows into a great tree that bears fruit. And that's why when you pray your prayers in the nights of Ramadan, this wonderful institution of tarawih for those who have made up the obligatory prayers that they've missed in their lives, then whether we're doing that or making up the obligatory prayers, we want that to be a time of heedfulness, that we now turn to the prayer that we do with a heedfulness that is even greater than the heedfulness that we had during the blessed days of Ramadan. And this is the secret of Ramadan, this combination of fasting in the daytime and then breaking the fast and then standing up to pray in in the night. And um, the Prophet said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that Satan runs through the veins of the son or the daughter of Adam, just like our blood runs through our veins. And he said that we need to constrict those channels in which Satan flows. And one of the ways we do that is by checking our shahwa, checking our passions, because the shahawat, our passions and lusts, our uncontrolled desires, these are the chief mechanism by which Satan controls us and by which Satan intervenes into our otherwise blessed lives. So in the controlling of the passions, in the day of Ramadan, not eating, not drinking, not having marital relations with our spouses and so forth, then we are developing this angelic quality of being able to have independence from the shahawat. This is also one of the reasons why the reward of fasting is a reward that is so great that we cannot quantify it. God taught us through the Blessed Prophet wasallam that all the good deeds that we do, acts of worship and other things, will be magnified ten times by God's 
vast generosity, ten times and more, up to seven hundred times. But in the case of fasting, no, because fasting is for God, and so God will reward it himself in a way that is beyond quantification. And one of the reasons for this, according to our scholars, is because we have given up our shahwa. We have given up these profound passions that we have that are rooted in our physical needs. And so therefore, we have become angel-like. And we have approached God in the best of all ways. And so therefore, he loves the faster. It is a gate to worship. And then he will give the faster a reward that is beyond any other reward. Be conscious of what you are doing. God created us to worship. And worship is what you and I were created for and all other human beings. We are a generation of worshipers. We are a nation of worshipers. So Ramadan is the month that we truly love. Turn back to God in this month. Devote yourself to God in this month. And utilize every breath and every moment of it for that purpose. And the Prophet ﷺ has directed us many times to have great expectations that in fasting this month, out of belief in him and seeking a reward from him, he will forgive us all of our sins that have preceded. And also in standing the nights in prayer out of faith and out of ihtisab, expecting the reward to come from God, that he will give us that same kind of forgiveness. This, however, does not mean that if you have not been praying your obligatory prayers, that you will be forgiven for that in Ramadan, and that you can pray tarawih in place of that, because you can't do that. And one of the things that causes the sickness of the heart also is shubuhat. Shubuhat are fallacies and misconceptions, And unfortunately, our Muslim ummah today has many fallacies and many misconceptions. And you will see people who don't pray all year long. But then when Ramadan comes, they pray and they think that that's enough. And that is nothing. You have got to make up all those prayers that you missed. And Ramadan is a very good time to begin if you haven't done that before. And be easy on yourself. Don't break yourself. But also be determined. This is a debt you owe God. And you need to pay that debt back. May God make that easy for all of us. Bi idhnillahi ta'ala. Of course, all of us know that fasting is imsak. It is refraining from certain things. The things that we've mentioned. And the other things that are forbidden in the month of Ramadan. That is the minimal fast. And of course, you want to do that with great sincerity. And if that's all you do, that will be enough. That will bring you a great reward. And it's also very important that we do not break our fast by gorging ourselves and overindulging. And this is a custom that unfortunately has begun to spread in many Muslim countries. So you don't want to be sleeping in the daytime and living at night. You want to be fasting in the daytime while you are awake, and then you want to get the rest that you need during the day, if necessary, and at night at the appropriate time, and you want to devote yourself to this gracious act. And when you break your fast, break it in moderation. This is not only good for your fast, but it's also good for your health. And what does it mean to break our shahwa in the daytime if we are going to indulge it in the in the evenings and nights of Ramadan as many people do? There are Muslim countries in which consumption of food and of sugar goes up two times or three times as much during Ramadan as any other time of year. This is a, not a time for feasting. This is a time for fasting. And at night, it is a time for moderation. One of the major objectives of the fast is to teach us moderation in all things. And this is what enables us to move from being al-insanul hayawan, 
the human being who is an animal. And animals can be very good, you know, and they can be very bad. And to go up to the insan al-kamil, the human being who is always perfecting himself or herself and going higher and higher. The humanism of Islam, which is the greatest of all humanisms, and which is also, by the way, the source from which the West got its humanism in the Renaissance. Our humanism, however, is transcendent. It is not uh, anthropomorphic in the animal sense of the human being. It does not glorify the passions and the failures of the human being, but it glorifies the fact that the son and daughter of Adam have the ability to rise above themselves. They have the ability to master their passions. They have the ability to channel their passions. And therefore, they can become angelic. And in becoming angelic, with these other human animal qualities that we have, then we are capable of actually going higher than the angels. And this is why the believer who does tawaf around the Kaaba, and of course, one of the best times of the year to do Umrah is during the month of fasting of Ramadan. But in going around the Kaaba, we are doing an act which is analogous to that of the angels themselves who are going around in tawaf around the throne of God, glorifying his praises, that those men and women among us, that extra special few who are arifin and arifat, who truly love God and know God, The tasbih that they do going around the Kaaba is even greater than that of the angels. And this is also the aspiration that you want to have in Ramadan, that you will be like the angels and you will in fact try to tap into your Adamic potential that makes you potentially even greater than the blessed angels. Ramadan is a great month and Although this minimum that is required is a great sufficiency, and as we said, it doesn't require much heedfulness. The mere act of giving up food, the mere act of giving up drink, the mere act of giving up marital relations with your spouse, that is something that takes the place of the kind of total heedfulness that is required, for example, in the blessed prayer of those who are near to God. But at the same time, we want to go higher than that minimum. And we want to be heedful. And that heedfulness begins by fasting also with our eyes and with our ears and with our tongues and with our hands and our feet and our other faculties and our other senses. And the way we do that is be careful what you look at in Ramadan. We should always be that way. But this is a month to protect your eyes and to lower our gaze with the gaze of chastity and not to be looking at things that we have no business looking at. The best thing to be looking at in this month is the sacred letters of the Holy Qur'an as you recite it, you memorize it, you review it, and you ponder it. That's what you should be looking at. Or looking at the Kaaba if you go to Mecca, in addition to tawaf and in addition to prayer. So we want to fast with our eyes. Watch what we look at. Be careful what we look at. Don't look at things that are haram. Try not to look at things that are makruh, reprehensible. And... uh Look at the things that please God, like recitation of the Qur'an, for example. And we want to fast with our ears so that we don't listen to that which is not pleasing to God and that which is not beneficial to us. And the two great conduits of the heart, they are the eyes and the ears Whatever you look at, whatever you listen to, it goes immediately to the heart. So you practice this in this month. 
and you want to also fast with your hands, your feet, and everything else, especially the tongue. Beware of what you say. Purify your tongue and uh, perfume your tongue with the sacred scent of the dhikr of God and with the recitation of the Qur'an and with words of wisdom. Whoever puts a bag of food between his heart and between um, uh, his chest, you know, that person, it is said, will be cut off from the ability to benefit from revelation. So don't do that. This is a month when you cannot eat, you cannot drink during the daylight hours. And you've got to become more intense in that as the month goes. And then don't put that bag of food between your heart and between your chest by thinking about fast breaking or thinking about the things you're going to eat at night or anything like that. You'll break your fast and that will be a farha. That will be a great joy. And as the Prophet said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the faster has farhatan, two great joys. You have a farha in breaking the fast, which is not only legitimate, it is something desirable because you give thanks for this great blessing of being able to drink water. May God never deny us water in the next world. And being able to eat delicious food. And the food, of course, tastes ten times as delicious now that you've been fasting. And maybe you're able to do that with your brothers and sisters, your family, you, the, the, the people you love. Maybe we can do it in the mosque. So that's a great occasion. That is a farha, and it's meant to be that. But don't overdo it. And don't spend the night feasting and, and, and uh, filling the stomach. Try to be moderate. And uh, this then enables us to get that heedfulness that we will then channel into the prayer that evening, bi idni lahi ta'ala. But especially with the tongue, fast with the tongue. Be careful not to backbite. Be careful not to be a tail bearer, a person of nemima. Uh, be careful to use this blessed tongue that you have with in silence that is golden, silence that is pensive and reflective, silence that pollinates the intellect. And be careful to use this tongue only to speak the truth and only to speak those things that you have been able to verify as probably true, if we don't know that they're absolutely true. And try to speak words of wisdom. Try to avoid exaggeration. Um, try to listen carefully to other people when they speak to you. And if you're fasting with your tongue, that becomes very easy because you're not trying to speak or to cut them off. And uh, then also learn to speak words of wisdom. Always remember when you speak to others, only speak the truth or what you have reasonable grounds to believe is true. And when you are speaking to others, don't tell them things that will harm them. This is one of the shurut. This is one of the prerequisites of speech. You don't have to say every true thing. There are many things that are true, but if we tell them to people, it will hurt them. Backbiting is, after all, truthful. It's just that it is harmful and hurtful. But even when there are things that are not backbiting, but they will hurt people because the people are not ready to understand them. They're not ready to accept them. Then you have to be wise. And it's not good to say that. And when we know that what we want to say is true and what we want to say is not harmful, then we have another box to check off. Is it actually beneficial? Or will it be of no benefit? at all. And if it is not all of those three things, truthful, not harmful, and it is truly positively beneficial, then you can speak. Otherwise, the best thing is to keep silence and to make dua. Ramadan is the great month of dua, and you want to turn yourself to that, you know, with all your heart and soul. And the people that you cannot necessarily transform or change. Don't get in their faces. 
Don't say words that they will reject and that will harm them, but be wise with them, be compassionate with them. Bi izni lahi ta'ala. Uh, may Allah enable us to fast perfectly. And of course, the highest fast of all is not just that you give up the wrong or the pernicious use of your eyes, your ears, your tongue, and your other faculties of action, but that you also positively devote yourself to the contemplation of God, that you turn to God in this month. You reflect on God. You delve into yourself to know the nature of yourself. You cannot know God if you don't know yourself. Many Muslims today are very lacking in any kind of self-consciousness. They're unaware of themselves. It's strange, as if they lived outside of themselves and had nothing to do with their soul. You want to delve into yourself in this month. That's also one of the things that's very good for health. In fact, some people even say that when people want to lose weight, one of the things they have to do is to give up their anxieties, their preoccupations, their fears, and other things like that. And not that they go out and play or exercise extensively, but that in addition to a wise program, of physical activity, that they also have time for themselves to turn into themselves, to think about themselves, uh, to come to terms with who they are and what they are and the failures that we've done. So this is also what you want to do in this month. Learn to know yourself. And in learning to know yourself, come to know your blessed Lord. This is the greatest of all knowledges, Malik ibn Dinar, may Allah be pleased with him, who was one of the great Salaf and one of the students of Al-Hasan al-Basri. Um, he said to his disciples, people leave this world without ever having tasted what is most delicious in it of all. And they said to him, and what is that? And he said, the knowledge of God. So this is also one of the beckoning calls of Ramadan. Your Lord is inviting you, know me, ta'arraf ilayya, come to know me, approach me, think about me, reflect on my words, reflect on my wisdom in this fast, give up your shahawat, give up these things just for a time, but learn to do that so that you can approach me in angelic fashion and so that you can be illuminated with the knowledge of God. So we ask God to let us also fast in this month by giving the world out of our hearts. You want the world to get out of your heart, and you want the world to be just in your hands so that you can work with it, you can dispense of it, you can do with it, whatever is wise and beneficial. But you don't want this world to lodge in your heart. And that is one of the greatest objectives of this blessed month. Learn to detach from your needs and learn to detach from this world. And then put God in your heart. Put the Prophet in your heart, sallallahu alayhi wa And purify your heart. Just as the Kaaba is washed out so there's nothing in it. You know, you want to wash out your heart too, which is like a Kaaba. And you want the thoughts that do tawaf around your Kaaba to be angelic thoughts and to be Rabbani thoughts, divine, lordly thoughts, and to be good thoughts that come from a refined soul. Bi'ithni lahi ta'ala. May Allah bless us in this wonderful month. What a blessed people we are to have this great occasion, this ninth lunar month that will come to us and we will take so much joy in seeing the crescent of the moon in the western horizon. And we will watch the moon go through its phases through this great month. And just as the moon goes through its phases, approaching the full moon in the middle of the month, so may each of us also go through our phases and reach the states of completion and of perfection 
and of purification and illumination that God wills for us. Every act of worship was created perfectly for you. Every one of them is a vehicle to take you to God. Every one of them is like Burak, that you get on with the permission of God and you can go at the speed of light from Mecca to Jerusalem and you can go up into the heavens. Of course, we don't do that literally, but this is for us a meaningful image and we want to take our acts of worship, prayer, fasting, zakat, charity, umrah, hajj, and so forth, dhikr. We want to take these as vehicles by which we approach God. We ask God to give us the great rewards. And for fasting in Ramadan, He will give you infinite rewards. And you will meet Him, bi ithnillahi ta'ala. That's your second farha, is that you will meet Him. So in fasting, there is this promise that you will be accepted and that you will die as a believer and you will meet your Lord, bi ithnillahi ta'ala. So we ask God to enable us to fast this month in the best of all ways, bi ithnillahi ta'ala. Fasting is an amazing thing. Um, all of our other acts of worship are actual activities that we engage in that can be easily seen by the eye. And fasting, of course, is not like that at all. Because in fasting, no one knows that you are truly fasting, but you and your Lord. It is a secret act that is between you. And so therefore also the fast has this amazing ability to produce sincerity, to protect us from hypocrisy, to protect us from show, and to develop a special relationship between us and between God. And the fasting gives us self-esteem. And although we are humble people who seek to grow in humility, which is the foundation of good character, we also must have self-esteem. We must have strength. And this comes with the sabr, the patience that is half of fasting and that is in one quarter of iman. We ask Allah Ta'ala to accept from us uh, this wonderful month. Keep it right. Keep it in a way that is worthy of this great prophet who taught us these wonderful things. Where does good character begin? Good character begins in the stomach. It begins with being able to limit what we eat and to eat with moderation and to eat with adab. And again, Ramadan is such a wonderful place to work on that because we will not eat during the day. And then may we all be among those who when we break our fast, we eat in great moderation and total gratitude. Amin. Please keep us in your prayers. Keep this wonderful ummah in your prayers. Pray that God deliver the Syrian people, the Iraqi people, the Yemeni people, that he deliver the Egyptians and the Libyans and others from these horrors of this time. And we really have no one to blame but ourselves. We have been, as an ummah, extremely heedless. We have been, as an ummah, extremely negligent. And when God punishes us, it is to make us come back to the right path. Never forget the Burmese Muslims. The Burmese Muslims today are facing a classical case of systematic genocide. May we pray for them every night. May we also do whatever we can do to bring these people to the attention of the world. They have been reduced to the most miserable status that it is capable, that a human being can be reduced to short of being killed and massacred. And they are facing that. So you pray for your Muslims in Burma and pray for Muslims in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, in all of the world, that God give us a way back and that he enable us to establish this deen in its beauty and that he enable us to unleash the beauty and the creativity of this religion that has always made it the religion of civilization and of civilizing people. There is no Islamic civilization in history. There are many Islamic civilizations that grew up like beautiful flowers 
uh, native to their indigenous regions, wherever this blessed faith went, the blessed faith of the most blessed of all God's creation, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you for listening. This podcast was brought to you by Seekers Guidance, the global Islamic seminary. Visit seekersguidance.org to access reliable Islamic knowledge taught by qualified teachers. We offer a wide range of courses, podcasts, articles, and a world-class answer service. Support us in spreading free, reliable Islamic knowledge to millions around the world by becoming a monthly supporter. Visit seekersguidance.org forward slash donate and make a small monthly commitment today. Our beloved prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, said, whoever guides someone to goodness will have a similar reward. So don't forget to share this podcast and spread prophetic guidance.